Greg Boyd, I'm, I'm a teaching pastor here. That's a little better. Um, and um, I tell you, I, I don't know if I've ever gone through that song, that we, the last song we did. I, I, I don't remember ever going through and not, not getting to the point where I couldn't sing it anymore because I get so choked up. It's just such, it's so beautiful. And, and the presence of God here is so powerful. Um, and you know, just the way that God takes everything and, in our life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and makes something beautiful out of it. it the beautiful God making beautiful people. Isn't that something? Isn't that, that's what, that's kingdom right there. That's the kingdom. And it's just, and I, maybe someone here needs to hear this, that, that maybe right now you're not seeing the beautiful stuff. You're just seeing the desert. You go through periods like that. Um, you, don't, you don't see the beauty that he's making out of it. All you see is the excrement that you've made. But just trust, just trust. Have faith in him and trust. His promise is that in all things, He's working together for the better for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He's, he's at work. There's stuff being born. Just be confident of that. Keep your eyes open. And, and that birth will come. You will be changed. Beauty will rise out of those ashes. Amen? Amen. But that's not my message. Uh, we're going to start a series here this morning on the gifts of the Spirit and how the Spirit wants to use those to form the, the body of Christ. There's four different lists of gifts that the Spirit gives the church uh, in the New Testament. We're going to be looking at one kind of special category of gift. They're not better than the others. They're just different. Uh, and they're called the charismatic gifts. Um, these are, are a unique category. Uh, Paul refers to them using a unique word, chrismata, and uh, uh, says that they're manifestations of the Spirit. And so there's a supernatural dimension to these gifts. Uh, for that reason, they tend to also be the most controversial. Uh, we believe these gifts are for today, but it occurred to us that we haven't taught on this for a long, long time. And so we want to have a, a little series about these gifts of the Spirit and how the Spirit wants to use them to form the body of Christ. Um, so this is, uh, we're entirely this spiritual bodybuilding. And uh, we're reading out of 1 Corinthians 12. And I'll read verse 1 and then verses 4 through 14. So Paul says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. That's why we're doing this series, because we realize that probably there's some folks here who are uninformed about this. There are different kinds of gifts. Now he uses the word chrismata, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but it's the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. And, and he's always emphasizing the same Spirit and the same God, because... These gifts are supposed to work together organically, not in competition with each other, but uh, under the direction of one and the same God, same Lord, same Spirit. So then he says in verse 4, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit, that's a special word he uses for this category of gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. All the gifts are for the common good. To one there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages. Uh, to still another, the interpretation of those tongues or languages. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, just as the body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. The body of Christ. One body, but it has many parts. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, it doesn't matter. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. All right, pray with me here for a moment. Father, I submit this message to you and ask you to do with it what you see fit. Uh, in the same way that the spirit distributes gifts to each one as he determines so also lord apply this message to our life uh, as you see needs to be applied if we need a kick in the butt give us a kick in the butt if we need to set a fire under us to inflame our passion do that if we need encouragement lord let it be a source of encouragement if we need instruction lord let this be a source of instruction for everybody in this auditorium for our pod parishioners uh, for those who are regulars here for those who are visiting i just pray a tremendous blessing on everyone and Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive your word here this morning in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. So this morning, I'm kind of going to lay the foundation for the next several weeks as we're going to be talking in the next several weeks about the specific gifts, the chrismata, and explaining what each of those are and how they can function. 
Well, this morning I'm going to lay the foundation by talking about two convictions of Paul that are evident in this passage. Two foundational assumptions that are evident in this passage. Because uh, if we don't get these down, we're never going to be moving in the gifts of the Spirit the way that the Spirit wants. Uh, the first conviction of Paul it concerns the nature of the Spirit and how he works. The second one concerns the nature of the church that the Spirit is forming. So if we'll first talk about the Holy Spirit, and then we'll talk about um, the church that he builds and strengthens. It, it's clear in this passage, as it is from a number of other passages, that the Holy Spirit for Paul and the early Christians wasn't simply a concept or a belief. It's really clear from this passage and from a number of other passages that the Holy Spirit for them was an experienced reality. The Holy Spirit was someone they had an ongoing relationship with. The Holy Spirit was someone who directed them, led them, empowered them. And the Holy Spirit was someone that they listened to and submitted to on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. And you find this throughout the New Testament. If you look at the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit's poured out, and then there's immediately this manifestation of, of different supernatural things. And then throughout the book of Acts, you find the Holy Spirit leading people, guiding people, directing people, telling Paul to don't go to that city, go to this other city, and, and he's, he's directing things. There's an experienced reality there. They, they had a supernatural dimension to their faith. And, in, and the Holy Spirit intersected with their life on, regular, on a regular basis. Um, in fact, Paul goes so far as, as to say that this is to be the case for all children of God. Not just for a special category of super spiritual people, but he says as many uh, as are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. His assumption is that if you're a child of God, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. There's, the Holy Spirit will be present in your life, directing you, empowering you. And our job then is to be following his lead. And so in the New Testament... In the early church, the Holy Spirit wasn't simply something that they believed in, the third person of the Trinity, a concept or something. It was, it was, an, it was an experienced reality. They lived in the Spirit, they walked in the Spirit, and the Spirit moved through them and led them and directed them. So now let's ask this question. I mean, really, it comes down to, for many of us, what happened? Um, at, at, when was the last time? That you did something that you didn't plan on doing because you just sensed you were supposed to do it. You did something spontaneous. Uh, yesterday, the day before, or this last week, did, was there anything that you did that you didn't plan on doing? That you, that anything you did for reasons other than that you wanted to do it? And for a good percentage of us, the answer to that would, would probably be no, if we're honest. We tend to be a people who do what we want to do. We have our plans. We have our agendas. We do what seems reasonable. We go to the store because we wanted to go to the store. We bought this thing because it seemed reasonable to buy this thing. We talked to this person because we wanted to talk to this person. We make the decisions. And here's the problem with this, is that we confess Jesus to be Lord of our life. And yet we make all the decisions. What's wrong with this picture? We say he's Lord of our life, but really our life a real life, our actual life, is nothing more than a series of present moments strung together, and we're making the decisions in 99.9% .9 of those moments. So in what sense is he really Lord? Let's just sit in this uncomfortable observation. What do you think if, if someone says, you know, they go, to, they, they go to work and they got a boss, they just never listen to him. <laughs> they make all the decisions. Uh, what kind of boss is that? I suspect this person wouldn't be around very long in that office working there. To be a boss means that the boss makes the decisions and you submit to those decisions. Um, and and this, is, this is, I think, why the early church had a supernatural dimension to their walk that we tend to lack. Uh, they were attentive at hearing the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, and so they didn't just have their own agendas and their own plans and do their own thing. Um, they, they, they submitted to him. They, they had a, a sense of uh, an awareness of his presence and experience, an experiential relationship that caused them to do things that they didn't plan. There's a lot of spontaneity stuff that goes on there under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So they learned how to walk with the Spirit moment by moment, but we tend to govern ourselves moment by moment. And, and, and they, they knew how to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, but let's be honest, we tend to rely on our own power 99.9% .9 of the time. So for them, the Holy Spirit was this experienced reality, but for us, most of the time, He's just a concept, a mere belief. And I, I, I don't say this to indict us. I don't think it's because we're terrible, evil, pagan pigs uh, who just are running from God. I, I don't think that. Uh, there's a lot of things you could point to in our culture that condition us to systematically block God out of our consciousness, out of our awareness. 
And so we live as though we're Lord of our own life. But the important question isn't why are we this way? The important question is what can we do about it? To begin to get back to that New Testament sort of uh, supernatural dimension that they had. And the answer to that is quite simple, though it may be challenging to carry out. The answer is, let's just start listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, let's just start actively listening to the Holy Spirit. And when I say actively listening, that, that means you listen by leaning into someone. You strain to hear them. Because the thing is, God hasn't developed a speech impairment over the last 2,000 years, and he hasn't gone mute, and he hasn't taken a vacation. God, as we've said several times in this service, he's here, he is now, same God they had back then, same living Lord they had back then, same Holy Spirit they had back then, and God is still talking. He still wants to lead and direct and empower his people. The question is, is are his people listening? Are his people listening? Are our walkie-talkies on? Here's why this is challenging for us. You know, God always respects the personhood of people. He respects their, their, their free will, their, their autonomy. And, and so God doesn't bulldoze over people. And so the Holy Spirit, he, he doesn't usually speak in terms of uh, screams that you can't possibly ignore or with a megaphone in our ear. The Holy Spirit tends to speak with a still, small voice that can be ignored. And God doesn't bulldoze over people. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't shove us to get our attention, not usually. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks with a gentle nudge, a little gentle nudge. And here's the thing. If you're in a crowd, for example, you know, when I was at the Lincoln Park concert two weeks ago, man, we're squished together in the mosh pit like sardines. You know, just, and everyone's bumping into everybody, and we're jumping and having a blast. But if someone were to nudge me, just tap me on the shoulder, I wouldn't have noticed it. I got too much else going on, man. My, my, my brain space is full. Well, so also, folks, if our minds are completely occupied with our stuff, with our agendas, our plans, what we got to do, what we ought to do, you know, all of that, uh, we're not going to notice the little nudge. Our brain is already too crowded. There's no space to notice the little nudge, the little whisper of the Holy Spirit. And so if we're going to be a people who start to get in touch with the, uh, the Holy Spirit and, 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 and walk in him a, a, in, in, in a, on a day-by-day -day kind of basis, we're going to have to depopulate our brain, make some space to create an awareness that wherever we go, whoever we're talking to, whatever we're doing, the Holy Spirit is there. He's around us, and he wants to flow through us, and he just might have a, an opinion about where you should go and who you should talk to and what you should do. Uh, and we need to be open to that. Paul said in 2 Timothy that the good soldier doesn't become overly occupied with civilian affairs, but rather is always seeking to please his enlisting officer. Folks, we are soldiers here, right? We're in the middle of a war zone, stationed behind enemy occupied territory, and our job is to please our enlisting officer. To do that, we can't get so involved in civilian affairs, the practical things of life, that we turn off our walkie-talkie or don't notice that it's on. Uh, you know, it, it, we, we've got to be to save space in our awareness, to have our ear cupped to the small, gentle voice of the Holy Spirit, who still wants to speak to us. The Spirit speaks through that, that sense that you might get, I, I just a, a sense impression that you're supposed to do this or talk to that person. Or sometimes the Spirit speaks you know, through an image that just flashes through your mind. Or it could be a sudden mood change that you, you notice uh, as, as, you're, as you notice somebody. Uh, it's, you have an empathy or compassion towards them. The Spirit speaks in those kind of ways. But the ways that we can easily ignore unless we're looking for them and paying attention to them. Our problem here is this. One aspect of the culture that influences us here in the West is that we're, we're heirs of the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution. And out of the scientific revolution came what's called the naturalistic worldview. And as, as, as Christians who believe in miracles, we don't believe in naturalism, but we're easily influenced by it. Naturalism just holds that the universe is a closed system. There's nothing outside the universe that can ever, uh, ever break in. There's nothing supernatural. Everything that happens has a natural explanation to it, cause and effect. And then that gets applied to our brain and our, 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 our interior life. We tend to assume that everything that goes on in our brain and everything we feel is simply our doing. We did it. And so if we're walking along and, and notice a, a sense uh, or an image or an impression or something of that sort, well, first of all, if we're just doing our own agendas, we're walking with a naturalistic mindset, carrying out our own plans, we probably aren't going to notice it because our brain's too crowded. But even if we do notice it, that sense, that impression, that, that thing that just popped into your heart or popped into your head, we tend to dismiss it. It's just a brain burp, you know? The brain does funny things. Where'd that come from? I don't know. And we just sort of push it aside. 
It's interrupting our agenda and our plans. We got things to do. What's that weird brain burp that wants me to do something else? Nah, I just, we, we just dismiss it. We discredit our interior uh, world, the spontaneity of our interior world. But see, that's where the Spirit speaks. And so we're dismissing all the senses and impressions and all that stuff. We're dismissing the Holy Spirit. I suspect we do this all the time. We're, we're conditioned to do this. So if we're going to be a people who are walking in the Spirit, we've got to be a people who push back on the naturalism of our culture, the conditioning of our culture, and begin to take seriously, first of all, begin to notice the senses and impressions and, and, and intuitions that we have, and then to be give, begin to give them some credibility to the point where we're, we'll act on them. You have a sense impression, well, you were going to do this, but now I think I'm supposed to do this. There ought to be spontaneity in our life where there's maybe on a daily basis things that we do that we didn't plan on doing. Maybe even things that we do that interrupted what we planned on doing because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us and walks with us. Now, you might ask the question, well, how do you know when it's the Holy Spirit and not just a brain burp? And the answer is, I don't know. God, I always look to me for it. I really don't. I, 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 look at, I usually don't know if this is just me or the Holy Spirit. Um, and actually, I, I worry about people who don't have that question. I've met some, you've met some. They, they, everything they think and everything they feel is the Holy Spirit. If they thought it, well, then it must be the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's not good either. Uh, try having a debate with all those people. You're debating with God as far as they're concerned. Okay, so we don't want... A little bit of epistemological humility is in order. You know, we don't know. That's why uh, you know, when you have a word for someone, it shouldn't be, thus says the Lord God. Are you? No, just say, I'm getting a sense that maybe, bah. And if, if it lands, it lands. Um, so, but here's the thing. Here, here's how I operate. If I have a sense, an intuition, an impression, an image, whatever, it just pops into my head, I ask, is this something that Jesus would do? And if the answer is yes, then I just do it. Just do it. Because in the worst case scenario, you just did something that Jesus would have done, and you did it on your own, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing, right? That's a good thing. You just did a Jesus thing. So if Jesus would do it, then do it. And, let, and, and, and you'll find maybe sometimes that when you do that, once in a while, bam, it lands. It's exactly what the situation called for. And that's a confirmation that this was, in fact, the Holy Spirit leading you to do this. You see? <laughs> Kingdom coincidences, I call them sometimes. Kingdom coincidences. It just lands. So I, I, in Austria, a couple of weeks ago, walking with some, some uh, guys I met over there, and um, uh, we're, we're walking in the evening, talking theology and whatever, and I noticed over in, in the corner uh, this Muslim lady sitting on the ground with a box in front of her, and there was a sign out there, but I, I, it was in German, it's too far to read it anyways, uh, and, and for all I know, it said, you know, if you're a fool, put money in this box. I, I don't know. But I got an impression about her that I was supposed to go put some euros, some money, in, in that box. But here's the thing. I'm with these guys, and, and they don't know me that well. And so I, I mean, I think, oh, gosh, they might think I'm trying to impress them or be super spiritual. Look, I'm going to go give money. You, know, you didn't do that, did you? I'm going to do it. And I, you know, I got into my head about it. And... Um, and we just made a joke about this guy. He bought some fancy boots, and, and, and we were joking with him, saying, couldn't you have you know, given that money to the poor? And, um, and then I thought, well, then he might think I was serious about that, and this might be kind of indicting to him. And, and, you know. So now we're about 20 seconds down the road, because we're still walking, as I'm in my head trying to figure this out. But the lady wouldn't go away. I, I tried to say, okay, it was just me. It's just me. Forget about it. It's just a brain burp, you know. Uh, but it, pff, she kept coming back. It's like, go away, go, go away, go away. I, I, this kid, it's just me, it's just me. But she wouldn't go away, so finally I had to stop. The, the, I prayed, and I said, you guys, I'm, I, I, gotta, I think God wanted me to do something about 35, 40 seconds ago, and I didn't do it, so now i got to go back and do it. So I <laughs> ran back there, and I put 20 euros in this lady's uh, uh, box. Now, I'm not sure that that was the Holy Spirit. It could have just been a brain burp, um, although it was really persistent as a brain burp. But then again, you ever have that where you're trying not to think about something which just makes you think about it all the more? Like, right now, don't think about an elephant. Ah, y'all just violated it. You know, it's like, uh, pink elephant. Oh, there you go. He's th you, you, it's hard not to think a thought that you've already thought. The more you try. So it might have been one of those things. On the other hand, um, that act did something for one of the folks that we were walking with. It, it had a meaning to them. And that sort of confirmed for me that this was probably a, a Holy Spirit thing. Now, even if it wasn't, I'm quite sure that lady needed the 20-year-old more than I did, and something Jesus would have done. So it's a good thing. But in this case, I think it was the Holy Spirit who confirmed this. So, folks, I challenge us. And whatever it takes to remember to do this, we've we got to do. 
It's hard to change our mental habits. We're used to thinking naturalism. Everything that goes on in our head is our own doing. And so we are, we're used to censoring out all the stuff that doesn't make sense given our agenda and given our plans. Uh, we, we habitually censor God out. It's hard to swim upstream on this one, but we've got to do it. Because this is the only way to begin to tap into that supernatural dimension of our faith walk that the New Testament church really had. And as we'll see, all the gifts of the Spirit, the reason they strike people as weird now is because we tend not to live in this realm. And so having anything supernatural break through seems kind of weird, whereas actually the supernatural ought to be the natural for us. It ought to be, this is the pattern of things. We ought to be walking in this on a daily basis. And so it will take reminding one another or putting post-it notes up or whatever, but I can challenge us to walk with the awareness that the Holy Spirit is always around us, the Holy Spirit is always in us, and the Holy Spirit often wants to talk to us and lead us and direct us. And if we're doing this, I suspect that it will occur on almost every day, maybe a couple times a day, that we'll do something that we didn't plan on doing. Uh, something spontaneous. And once in a while, you're going to find confirmations that, in fact, that was the Holy Spirit. And that's when things get fun. This, this thing only gets fun when it stops being a belief and starts being an experienced reality that we walk in. And, and man, now, now, now see, the, the fingers are listening to the head, and the, the feet are listening to the head. They're actually doing what the head wants it to do, and that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. All right? So I challenge you to walk upstream against this naturalism and give credibility to stuff that you notice going on inside of you. So that's this thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to be an experienced reality. Now let's talk about what, uh, Paul's conviction about the church that arises in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. He says this, that... We saw him say this, that just as the body, though one, has many parts, for all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. So he, Paul is assuming here that when you're led by the spirit, and therefore you put your faith in Jesus Christ, because that's the first work of the Holy Spirit, that the spirit will lead you now to be immersed in the body, to be joined with the body of Christ. Uh, and that you have a role to play within that body. In the New Testament, to be a follower of Jesus means you are joined with, in a concrete way with others to now function as the body of Christ or an expression of the body of, of, of Christ. Uh, there's only one body, and we are all to be members of it. Uh, if, you're a, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a member of that one body, which means you have to be connected to it. Otherwise, you're, you're, in, you're amputated. Or to put it another way, where there's only one bride. And to be the bride of Christ, you've got to be joined to that bride. Not just in a theoretical, ethereal way, but, but concretely. In our, in our individual culture, our individualistic culture, a lot of times people think that we are individually the bride of Christ. So there's a billion brides. I'm the bride of Christ, you're the bride of Christ. We're all the you know, bride. And, and God loves us as though we were the one and only bride of Christ, for sure. His, his love could not be improved on. But see, God is not a polygamist. He doesn't have a trillion brides. He wants one. And the one is the corporate whole of all who are joined to that bride. To be the bride of Christ is to be joined to the one bride. To be the body of Christ is to be joined in a concrete way with the, 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 the body of Christ. And Paul's assumption is that everybody who is led by the Spirit of God will be led to function in the body in a particular way. Everybody. Uh, this isn't just for super spiritual Christians or, or something of the sort. Everybody who is following the Spirit will be joined to the body of Christ. The New Testament has no conception of an individual Christian who is not concretely joined with others to carry out the work of the kingdom, a concrete expression of the, uh, uh, of the body of Christ. And so I can say a word to whoever may be listening this weekend uh, who is one of those bedside Baptists or one of those, you know, uh, me and Jesus private religion things, the Lone Ranger Christians. God bless you. I love you. God loves you. But you're resisting the Spirit. Uh, and the authority of God, you're resisting the Spirit. God wants everybody connected in real ways with other disciples to do the work of the kingdom. Everybody. Now, you, we go through periods where we're between churches or between, you know, communities. I got that. I got that. There's sometimes where, you know, you, you're at a new place and you don't have folks around you that share your faith. But see, if you're listening to the Spirit, the Spirit will be leading you to form communities. And maybe two or maybe three, maybe 30, it doesn't matter. But we're never supposed to go this alone. We can't go this alone any more than your finger can do what it wants to do without being attached to the hand. Uh, we're all part of the, the body of Christ. And note this also. The body of Christ isn't 
It's merely a gathering like this where we sing songs, worship God, and, and listen to a message. This serves the body of Christ. This is good. It has an important function. But see, I can do my gift here, and some others in person can do their gifts, and the worship team can do their gifts, but you guys can't. You're receivers on this, and that's good. It's time to learn. Uh, but we all need to be doing things in the body of Christ. Uh, the, the, the New Testament conception of church isn't a, a, a weekly event. It's an organism. The body is an organism, and we all have a role to play in that organism. Uh, the body happens when everybody's working together for the common good. When there's others there and everybody's contributing to the common good. And see, the particular way that the Spirit leads you to contribute to the common good, that is your gift. That is your gift. Whether Paul's talking about the charismatic gifts or these other gifts, the, the role that you can play for the common good of any local body, that is the gift you bring it. This is like my hand is, is a gift to me when it scratches the itch that I need scratching. Thank you, hand. It's doing what he was supposed to do. Um, it's a gift to the body as a whole. Now, here again, here, a lot of people get mixed up because in our individualistic, narcissistic culture, many people hear this, this idea of the Spirit giving gifts as though it was a gift to them. Like, oh, goody, I got a present. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me the gift of tongues. Thank you for giving me the gift of prophecy or teaching or whatever it is. As though you were the recipient of the gift. But see, no, you got the gift in order to give the gift. And it becomes a gift the minute you give it. It's for the common good. It's not for your personal enjoyment. It's for the common good. Which, again, shows that he says to each one is given a gift. Everybody has this. And everybody's then to be contributing to the common good. That's how the body of Christ functions. That's how your body functions. So, you know, if your house is on fire, your nose becomes a tremendous gift when it smells the smoke and wakes you up. And then your eyes become a tremendous gift to the, for the good of the whole because now you can find your way out of the house. And your legs become a tremendous gift uh, if, if they work because now you can run out of that house. And your arms become a tremendous gift because now you can pick up your kid on the way out and save them too. See, it, the, the, when everything's operate the way they're supposed to operate, they are being a gift for the good of the whole. When you're hungry, your stomach is being a gift to you because it's telling you that you need nourishment. And then your teeth are a tremendous gift because now you can chew the food. And your taste buds are a great gift because they can tell you how wonderful it tastes or if this is poison and, and stuff you're not supposed to eat or rotten or it's going to make you sick. So it's when the body does what the body's supposed to do, when each part plays its role, it is a gift for the good of the whole, and that's how it is with the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, God, the Spirit gives it to you, but the purpose is to give it away. It's like we sang a little bit earlier. Uh, yes, uh, you, you received a blessing, but you've received it to give the blessing. And yes, the seed that was sown in you, you was sown so that you could now sow it in others. And the kingdom is all about the good of the whole, and we all have gifts to bring to this. And again, Paul says everyone has this. To each one is given. And folks, what that means is that you, you are a gift to the body of Christ. Whoever's listening to this message, you are a gift to the body of Christ. You have something to bring that's important. It means you are important to the body of Christ. You are needed in the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is going to suffer if you don't play the role that you are equipped to do. You are a gift. Now, maybe somebody listening to this, in fact, I'm sure somebody listening to this is thinking, oh, easy for you to say. I'm not a gift. I'm, I got nothing special. I got nothing to give to anything. I don't have any spectacular talents. I don't have anything impressive. Look, uh, that is, I would tell you in Jesus' name, that is one humongous pile of pure, undiluted poppy crapola. Uh, that, is just, that is not of God in Jesus' name. I rebuke that thought. You are a gift. You've got stuff to contribute. And it's not about, it's not about being impressive. It's not about being impressive. Look at my hand doesn't need to be able to play Rachmaninoff's Prelude in G minor, Opus 23, in order to scratch the itch I got. I'm impressed that I can scratch it, all right? Thank you, hand. It's doing what it's supposed to do. The gift is simply doing what you're called to do. And in fact, Paul says, not only is it not about being impressive, but it's the, those gifts that are not impressive, those gifts that are uh, the least, that go unnoticed, those are the most important ones. And that's just like the kingdom where the first is last, the last is first. No, it, it's, it's not about being impressive. It's about doing what needs to be done. 
And when you can scratch the itch of the body of Christ and you can uh, have the eyesight of the body of Christ or smell the fire because you're the nose of the body of Christ or whatever the role you need to play, that is what you're called to do. Who cares if it's impressive? Maybe mom and dad didn't tell you you were special and maybe grandparents didn't treat you like you had anything important to give and maybe friends and relatives and ex-husband and wife didn't think that anyone needed you and, and maybe your own kids don't appreciate you, but who cares? I'm telling you, God says you're a gift. You're important. You got something to bring. Bring it. Everyone's got this. So the question, folks, isn't do you have a gift? The question is, is what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Are you sitting on it or are you giving it away? Um, and see, here's the thing. The gift only becomes a gift when you give it. can't become a gift any other way. Uh, it, it, it's like if I was going to go to my granddaughter's three-year three -year birthday party, Eden. I walk in, I got a bag of presents. She sees them, she goes, oh, she gets all excited like she does and jumps up and down and drools, you know, she says, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't Finally, when she settles down, she says, well, can I have a gift? And what'd you think of me if I were to say, oh, no, they're, they're your gifts, but I'm not going to give them to you. <laughs> no, no, they'll stay in the bag. Well, you would have the right to say, and she would have the right to say, well, what kind of gift is that? A gift is only a gift when you give it. Uh, the gifts are supposed to be given. If you don't give it, it's not a gift. And so here's the thing. You only are going to be the gift you're, that you were called to be if you're giving yourself away in the body of Christ. If you're playing the role that you're supposed to play, and all of us, all of us, all of us, every, every, every believer has a role to play, an important role to play in the body of Christ. And if you don't play that role, then you will suffer and the body as a whole suffers. Some aspect of God's plan for you and the body that you were called to is going to be thwarted because you were unwilling to offer the gift that you had to bring. Um, it, it, it's, like, it's, like, it's like your physical body. If things don't do what they're supposed to do, well, the, 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 the common good, the good of the whole, is going to be qualified, compromised to some degree. If you're not doing what you're, you're called to do, then you know, you know the old uh, saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. You atrophy. There's, there's, a, there's a spiritual equipping there that you're supposed to give, and if you're, if you're not using it, well, you, you'll just get weaker. You will not be all that you can be in Christ unless you're doing that gift. And the body will suffer because a part that's needed to be played isn't being played. It's like several years ago, or no, several years ago, it was probably 15, but I was um, a teaching at Bethel and in a theology class, and at this stage of this class, uh, we had people giving presentations on different topics, the research topics. Um, and there's this one guy who was giving his research topic, and he was going way long, and it was very boring, and uh, I, I was struggling to stay awake. Uh, and, and so I was sitting in this too small of a desk with my legs crossed, listening to this boring paper. Finally, thank God, he ended. And I stood up to go to the front of the class, and I just oh, completely fell over. It was like, I, I, I couldn't stand up straight. I grabbed down this desk, this gal, and I almost tipped the desk over on me. This gal was freaked out, but my foot wasn't working. And you know how that is. I hate that. It's like, I, and you get that tingly kind of feeling like, ah, ah. I, I could not stand on that leg for my life. It was, and so I'm up in the class and I'm walking like this, you know. Getting out of the sun. I looked like I was drunk. It's because the stupid foot went rogue on me. It wasn't doing what the head was telling it to do. It, was, it, it fell, fell asleep. And whenever you have a body part that doesn't function like it's supposed to function, it, it, the whole suffers. And the good news is that the older you get, the more that happens. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? It, it, things, they, they start doing what they weren't supposed to do, and they stop doing what they are supposed to do. Like hair. Hair is supposed to grow on the head. It stops. It stops growing. It starts disappearing. And it's like my ears suck the ha hair out of my head. And you start developing this forest. I'm like, really? I got hair in my nose and ears that grows like five times as fast as my hair on the head. I got to cut it weekly or I got this bush coming out. It's ridiculous. Why does my nose need hair and why do my ears need hair? And why do butts need hair? I mean, what's up with that? All of a sudden you got, these are rogue hairs, I'm telling you. So this whole, this whole message comes out of this. Don't be a, 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 a hair butt on the body of Christ, all right? Just don't be a, a hair on the butt of the body of Christ, all right? Do what you're supposed to do. And don't do what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> I don't know. All right, all right. I should have entitled this sermon, Don't Be a Butt Hair on the Body of Christ. You remember that. 
Y'all have a role to play. So folks, and I may maybe ask the question, well, how do you know what, what, what you're supposed to play? What role are you supposed to play? Maybe I'm being a butt here in the body of Christ. I just don't know. You know what, how do you know? So this brings us back full circle. The Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is real. He's here. He's now. He talks to us. And one thing you'd be sure of, whatever else he tells you to do, he's going to be telling you to be involved in that, whatever church you're called to. If it's Wilderness Hills, it's Wilderness Hills. If it's someplace else, apply to that body. But wherever you're called, you have a role to play alongside others, whether it's a house church, whether it's something bigger. Um, you have a role to play that is important and necessary. And the Holy Spirit's talking to you about that. And so I encourage us. You know, some folks here are fully, completely doing what they're supposed to do. You have no more space because you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. And so you're off the hook on this one. Others of us, I, I'm, I'm going to encourage us to check out the ministries that are out there. We have all these ministries that have openings, that have needs. Uh, and we believe the Holy Spirit wants to fill those. Because those ministries we think are of God. And so check those out. Um, and as you do that, be listening to what's going on inside of you. Uh, that sense, that impression, that image. Something, something changes when you look at that ministry. You can see yourself doing this, however it is. And, um, and that is, all other things being equal, the one that the Holy Spirit's calling you to. Uh, now, even if it is just you, you're still doing a good thing. But, but we want to be placed particularly where the Holy Spirit wants us, so be listening to that. Um, and, and giving that credit. And, and, and if, 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 if it's something that's a significant commitment for you or you might have to give up doing something else, you, you may want to ask others to be praying with you and discerning this because everything in the kingdom operates better when it's done in community with others. So if there's people in your life that you trust, say, would you, you know, pray about this? Am I supposed to do this ministry or this ministry? And ask them to help you discern uh, where the Spirit is leading. And if you don't feel anything as you're walking around out there, well, then just do something. <laughs> Whatever one, you know, you like, just, just do that one. Whatever one you think you'd be best at, then just do that one. Because probably that was the Holy Spirit. You just haven't learned to identify that voice yet. Uh, you just assumed it was your one. Actually, maybe the Holy Spirit is one who's, who's leading you in that direction. But even if not, you're doing something that's good. At least you're doing something, which is way better than doing nothing. We all want to be plugged in exactly as the Lord wants us to be. So in our everyday life, as we're walking, going to work, mowing the lawn, engaging with neighbors, watching television, whatever, let's get, keep, a, keep our walkie-talkies on. Keep a space open in your brain. Just say, Holy Spirit, if you've got anything to say to interrupt my plans, by all means do. And give credibility to that still small voice inside of you. And, and then for those of you who are, are uh, not already plugged in where you're supposed to be, check out the ministries that are available. I'm going to close in prayer. I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up as I do. Um, and if you're here and have any need whatsoever that could use prayer, please stop by and have these folks pray, pray for you. Uh, you don't have to carry that burden, that concern uh, on your own. But just stand. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you are real. You are here. You're around us. You are in us. And you're still talking. Help us to listen, to actively listen, to lean in on your voice. Help us, Lord God, to uh, not walk with the assumption that everything inside of us is just our own doing. Help us, Lord, to have the boldness to step out when you tell us to step out to do the things that we didn't plan on doing. Help us, Lord God, to be a people who submit our plans and agenda to you because, Lord, we confess we are not Lord of our own life. You are Lord of our, our life, and we want that to count on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. But remind us, we, we, we will forget. We will forget. So, Holy Spirit, will you bug us? Will you just lovingly nag us? Wake us up. Wake us up to the reality that you are here. In you, we live and move and have our being, and we want to live under your direction in Jesus' name. And all of God's Spirit, let people say it. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Go out and love on the world.